Hello, everyone, and welcome to Xavier University. I'm Nancy Berteau, Professor of Economics and Faculty Co-Chair of Xavier's Sustainability Committee, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. Uh, a quick reminder, uh, asking you to turn off all your cell phones. Uh, last year, uh, we had a theme, and it was energy justice. And some of you heard in this room visionaries Amory Lovins in October of 2013 and Jeremy Rifkin in March of 2014 speak on that challenging topic. Next year, we're planning a series on consumption justice. Our theme this year is water justice. We define water justice as sustainable forms of water that are ecologically sound as well as economically advantageous for all members of society, especially the least well off. In October, we heard from water journalist Cynthia Barnett on Blue Revolution, a water ethic for America. Tonight, you'll hear a presentation by Maud Barlow on Blue Future, Protecting Water for People and the Planet Forever, which I really love that title, the forever, followed by an opportunity for dialogue with you, which will then be followed by a book signing in the front of the room there. You may not know, but this Sunday, March 22nd, is World Water Day. It's been proclaimed that by the United Nations. And if you go to the United Nations website and take a look at some of the information that they have there, it's very enlightening. And it's very appropriate to have Maud here. Maud was really uh, beyond crucial. She was, she was really the key player in a series of events which five years ago ended up having the UN declare water as a basic human right. So we're very, very pleased and proud to have her here tonight. One of our co-sponsors I'd like to single out here, where are you, Brewster, is Green Umbrella. And I'd like Brewster Rhodes to stand up. He's in the green t-shirt. Brewster has been the executive director of Green Umbrella, which is built on the collective impact model. And Brewster is an example that you need so many people. There's hundreds of organizations now in the Cincinnati area that belong to Green Umbrella. Many of you here, I'm sure. But he's an example of bringing people together, the power of that. But beyond that, he's also an example of the power of what one person can do when they set their mind to it. Uh, Mon Barlow is another such example. So for all you students here, if you need any convincing that one person can make a difference, uh, take a listen here to Maude Barlow and also see if you can grab Brewster after the event and talk to him about what he's accomplished. I'd now like to introduce James Buchanan, the director of the Brueggemann Center for Dialogue, our co-sponsor. Then introducing Maude will be Mark Miller, a senior here at Xavier. And we're very proud to say that he'll soon be one of our first graduates in one of several interdisciplinary sustainability programs. His degree is a BA in ECOS, Economic Sustainability in Society. Good evening. I am the aforementioned James Buchanan, director of the Brueggemann Center here at Xavier University. I'd like to join Nancy in welcoming all of you who are here tonight. I would also like to welcome our C-SPAN audience who is with us to this latest series on environmental justice. Like all works towards sustain a sustainable future, events such as this are collaborations of many organizations. Along with the Brueggemann Center and the, the Sustainable Sustainability Committee, our co-sponsors include Green Umbrella, as has been mentioned, which is our regional sustainable alliance, Xavier's Senior Administrative Fellow for Sustainability and Environmental Imagination, the Philosophy, Politics, and Public Honors Program, the Economics, Sustainability, and Society Program, the Sustainability, Economics, and Management Program, the Land, Farming, and Community Program, the Environmental Science Program, and the MA in Urban Sustainability and Resilience Program. The existence of these programs at Xavier, along with the groundbreaking work being done by our regional alliance, Green Umbrella, is the best indicator of how seriously we regard the issues and the challenges of sustainability. One upcoming event, which you will also be interested in, is the Midwest Regional Sustainability Summit, 
which we held here at Xavier in this space on May 1st. This is a collaboration between the City of Cincinnati, Green Umbrella, and Xavier University, along with a long list of businesses, as well as the mayors and sustainability directors from cities throughout the region. It is our first attempt to look at regional best practices and the possibility of regional collaboration on issues of sustainability. For more information on attending or participating in this event, please see the flyers at the Brueggemann Center table. We are particularly pleased to have with us tonight Mar Maud Barlow because we recognize that the heart of all sustainability efforts is water. Maud has been an eloquent and passionate voice on the challenges we face if we are to achieve what she calls a blue future. To introduce her tonight is a true representative of that future, one of our students, a senior majoring in economics, sustainability, and society, Mark Miller. Mark. Maud Barlow is the world's preeminent water rights activist. In fact, if you Google the phrase water rights activist, she's the first and only person specifically named in the results. She chairs the board for or is a member of the Council of, uh, Council of Canadians, Food and Water Watch, the International Forum on Globalization, and the World Future Council. She holds 12 honorary doctorates and has received numerous awards for her work on water rights, most recently the Earth Care Award, the highest international honor of the Sierra Club. She's highly published and her latest is Blue Future, protecting water for people and the planet forever. We are honored to have her here at Xavier. Please help me and welcome her. Wow, thank you very much. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you, Mark, for your beautiful words. I'm quite embarrassed that that's true, that that's, if I come up first, I am gonna look. Uh, thank you so much to Nancy Berteau and Ann Doherty and uh, Elizabeth Zuelke for of the Sustainability Committee. Thank you so much, James Buchanan, for your beautiful words and your work, and Cynthia Cummins for the great work you do at the Brueggemann Center. And I just a, a shout out to uh, Edward Brueggemann, the, the founder. Um, and I just want to say that it is a true pleasure speaking at a university where your stated goals have to do with peace and justice, and that's actually up front. Um, who you are, and I, I, it's not that common actually, and so it's just really a, a treat to be here. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the global water crisis, and welcome, by the way, to the high school students. We're really happy you guys came here. It's really special that you're here. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do and what we are doing, because I, I want to say to you that I hate it when people my age come to talk to younger people and say, oh, it's doom and gloom and you should just, you know, forget about it. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> Tear your hair out. Um, <clears throat> actually, there's lots we can do about the crisis that I'm going to talk to you about. And I do deeply believe that hope is a moral imperative. And so if I share with you some of the bad news, it's also uh, it's because I'm going to then share with you what I think we need to do about it. But I do think we need to face the actual uh, dimension of the, of the crisis. We have seen an enormous uh, increase in the amount of water that we are using as a human species in the last couple of decades, basically a 50% increase in withdrawals um, in a very, very short time. We are seeing what some of us are, are calling running dry. Um, we're seeing massive pollution of our surface water and even massive pollution of our groundwater. I don't know if you know, but in the United States, it is legal to dump uh, toxic waste into the groundwater sources, and the, uh, massive amounts are actually being dumped. Uh, out of sight, out of mind, I guess, is the, is the thought, but I was sharing today with others that uh, they found an aquifer under Mexico City. Mexico City's in real trouble um, water-wise, and they've taken out all the water under the city, but they did find another aquifer, and when they pulled the first glass 
a cup of this new fresh water up. The engineer said, then drank it and said, it's delicious. And he said, this is why you don't destroy your groundwater, because someday you're going to need it, no matter where you are. We're also damming rivers, and we're also pulling up groundwater. I call it groundwater mining, way faster than these groundwater sources can be replenished. Um, and we're damming rivers so that most of the major rivers in the world no longer reach the ocean. And where the rivers, where freshwater meets saltwater is one of the very important spawning grounds for aquatic life. Now we're doing this for many reasons, but the most urgent demand on water is for uh, food production for the global market economy. And it's really important for us to start off with a, uh, with a knowledge of something called virtual water. Virtual water is the water that's embedded in the things that we eat or the clothes we wear or computers or whatever. And up until not long ago, the United Nations was saying that each person on Earth uses X amount of water. Uh, and now we understand that that's probably about one-tenth of the water that we really use. Nine-tenths of the water that we use is not something that we see or touch. It's, in, it's embedded in, in, uh, in our dinners and so on. If you sit down as a family of four, to a small stake each, you're, you're consuming the equivalent of a, an Olympic-sized swimming pool with, with that stake. And this is, we're beginning now to bring this into the equation and understand what this means. And what's happening is it's like, kind of like a bathtub. It's like oh, a bunch of us sitting around a great big bathtub with a lot of water in it, and we've got blindfolds, and we've got straws, and we're drinking up that water really fast. And we think it's fine because there's lots of water and there's lots of water for everybody. And then all of a sudden, there's no water for anyone. It's called exponential uh, overuse of something. And so you can't see it coming. It's not like one and one makes two and two and two <coughs> makes four. It's the exponential overuse of, of something that's finite. Uh, last uh, month, there was the World Economic Forum held for leaders around the world. It was held in uh, Davos, Switzerland, which always is. And always every year they do research ahead of time on what are the major issues. And they talked to 900 experts around the world. And to a person they said, it's the coming water crisis. It's here in terms of impact. Uh, another meeting of the uh, UN of uh, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, brought 500 scientists together and they said that what we're doing now is what they called planet to water, is what they called a planetary transformation as great a change to the world and the planet as the melting of the ice age. Um, and they also, <clears throat> in a separate, different study, the, again, this one done through the World Bank, um, the statistic that stunned the world at the time was two years ago, is that it, uh, by 2030, the demand in our world for water will outst outstrip supply by 40%. And this is just almost impossible to try to understand. And of course, you stop and think about who's going to do without. It's going to be the poor. It's going to be the marginalized. It's going to be the people um, around the edges. It's going to be the people in slums, the massive slums of the global south, or the people in poor communities here in North America. It's also going to be the animals. It's going to be uh, the species that can't survive um, easily without water. So I just want to give you a few examples of what we're talking about. India is in terrible trouble. 60% um, of all of their uh, water for um, farming comes from irrigation. And so they're pulling up, again, their groundwater and damming their, their rivers really seriously, depleting water in some places by five feet a year. Uh, and literally in, in some of the states uh, beginning to run dry. China, 75% of all their surface water is polluted. And here's a st stunning new report that since 1990, half of the rivers in China have disappeared. How, what do you mean disappeared? They're gone. They're disappeared. And that's partly from hydroelectric uh, coal, uh, mining for hydroelectric power, but it's also because they're using their water and their air and their soil to produce so much of the stuff that then gets sent around um, to the rest of the world. Uh, there were two lakes I want to tell you about. One was the Aral Sea in the former Soviet Union, so big a lake it was called a sea. And the other is Lake Chad in Africa. Once the fourth largest and sixth largest lakes in the world, now almost nothing, both of them just down to a, a bare, almost a bare trickle. In each case, it wasn't climate change as we have come to understand it, it was absolute overextraction. The story that most disturbs me right now is Brazil. <clears throat> Brazil has been until recently considered the country with the most water, the most water-rich country in the world. They never had droughts. 
tons of water, right? They have the Guarani Aquifer, they have the rainforest, they have a massive area between the rainforest that holds a, a tremendous amount of water. But suddenly Sao Paulo, one, the second biggest uh, city in, in uh, Brazil, with about 20 uh, million people living there, has gone dry. I mean, I when I tell you oh, in the last two years, there was no problem two years, three years ago, it is going dry incredibly fast and there's been massive drought for the last few years right across Brazil. Well, it turns out it's because they're cutting down the Amazon. And what we now know is that when you cut down forest or rainforest or vegetation, it changes the hydrologic pattern. And these, these rainforests give off massive amounts of humidity uh, and vapors, and they form what they call flying rivers. So you've got to try to think of it as a river in the sky uh, being held up by air, by air currents. But then it can travel thousands of miles, and then it delivers rain to Sao Paulo and other places. Well, they're cutting down that Amazon and the rainforest because they're growing massive amounts of sugarcane and soybeans to make ethanol to put in cars, not only in Brazil, but around the world. And so much of this is for export. So again, not only cutting down the trees, but taking up massive amounts of water in the form of virtual water um, and, and uh, basically sending this water away. The Great Lakes, a very big issue for those of us um, living, you guys live you live about as far away from the Great Lakes as I do. I live in Ottawa, Canada, so we're about equidistant to the Great Lakes, not far. The Great Lakes are in very serious trouble. We have uh, invasive species, massive pollution, but we also have over, over pump, pumping, uh, over exploitation of the water system itself. I won't give too many studies, but one other study on groundwater taking said that if the Great Lakes are being pumped as mercilessly as groundwater around the world, the Great Lakes, and I quote, could be de dead dry, bone dry in 80 years. Now, if you've ever stood on the bank of the big, the big lakes, Superior and Michigan and so on, you can't imagine, but that's why I told you about the Aral Sea. It is possible to take a massive amount of water and destroy it. We're also dealing with eutrophication, which is that blue-green algae. You read about it in Toledo last summer. They're expecting it may come back again this summer. This comes from industrial farming, chemical-based agribusiness, where we do not have proper regulations, and this stuff is these nutrients are running off into our water systems. There are 67,000 square miles of agriculture, agribusiness around the Great Lake Basin. Um, and it is poisoning them. The, the, the uh, patch that we thought we got rid of in Lake Erie is back, and it is a very serious issue. You probably know that your own Ohio River has been named the most polluted body of water in the United States for seven years running. And I know there's a tremendous amount of work being done in Cincinnati and in the state on uh, renewable energy and on um, this being a kind of uh, a very exciting area for high-tech solutions to our water problems, but we are not stopping the water at pollution at its source, and we need to understand this. Uh, there's 23 million pounds of chemicals were dumped into the Ohio River last year, and we have to, we have to find a way to stop this. Martin Luther King said uh, many wonderful things, but one he said was that legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. Sometimes I see people doing wonderful things, but their government still will not stop the people doing bad things from doing those bad things. And it's like you can't catch up because you can't keep up with the destruction taking place. So we absolutely need to regulate and say nobody is going to be allowed to do that to these lakes. And the recent concern that I have is that the Great Lakes are, are increasingly being used as what I call a carbon corridor to move the dirtiest energy on Earth by train, by pipeline, around and even under the Great Lakes, and most recently being shipped on barges and in ships on the Great Lakes. Um, this is the bitumen from uh, Alberta, tar sands, and we're fighting very hard in our country because this is an oily, thick substance, and the only way to get it through pipelines is to lace it with liquid chemicals. And when they spill, they make massive, massive, uh, uh, you know, dead zones and, and terrible, create terrible pollution. And now the Coast Guard in the United States has given the okay to ship on ships on American waterways wastewater from fracking. 
which is amongst the most uh, volatile substances that we can. And to my mind, when we know what we know about the water system, the water situation, the water crisis in our world, how we can do this is it continues to be just stunning to me. Um, Colorado, the Colorado Basin, Lake Mead, which is the reservoir that was uh, created when the Hoover Dam was built, all of these are down. There's a new NASA study that says that they've taken down uh, enough uh, water, groundwater, out of the Colorado Basin to provide all the water that's needed for eight, um, for all American households for eight years. I mean, that's just, we just put these bore wells down and we drink this stuff up. There are 200,000 bore wells in the Ogallala Aquifer. That's that massive aquifer that goes right down the spine of the U.S. down to the Texas uh, Panhandle. Um, again, building massive uh, industrial farms to grow corn for corn ethanol um, and pumping up that groundwater with pumps that weren't designed until the late 1950s. So before that, they had no ability to pull up that groundwater. It's only in you know, 70 years or whatever that we've been able to green the desert in that way, but there's a terrible price. And the terrible price is that the Department of Agriculture here in the United States said two years ago that the Ogallala Aquifer will be gone in our lifetime. And you try to say that to people who farm there or who live there, and this, you know, you, it's going to be gone. And people say, I don't know what you mean. Uh, yesterday, the Los Angeles Times, if this isn't a headline that's going to get to you, I don't know what will, but it was their major uh, headline, their major editorial said, California has one year left of water. Are we ready to ration yet? Look it up. You don't believe me. Look it up. How can we get up every morning and say that it's business as usual? It's not business as usual. I just go back to the people in Sao Paulo. I visited some communities and they get their water now. This is from water rich area two years ago, three years ago. They have water from five to six in the morning, just a trickle, and that's then it's turned off. They have water again from 10 to 11 at night, and you better do whatever you need to do that needs water.